Cinema Jaws brought to you by Second City Training Center. Find your funny this week with a $20 improv drop-in class at the Second City Training Center in Chicago. Your first drop-in class is on them. Use the code TESTDRIVE for a free improv drop-in any Sunday at 7 p.m. For more information, go to secondcity.com backslash TC or call 312-664-3959 to register. And we thank them for their support. You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location at Cards Against Humanity in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rye the Movie Guy. And sitting alongside us in the fish tank is Phil Me and Phil. How's it going, everyone? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we get real, we get impactful, as we cover our top five favorite documentaries that had an impact on us. I'm almost as excited as Phil would be if we were covering animation. Because you love documentaries. I do. I do. As For as much as I uh, really love the blockbuster summer tent poles, I love documentaries even more. We are, it's my artistic side. We are doing this, Matt, because we have one hell of a guest joining us this week. One hell of a guest, yes. Uh, the founder and artistic director of Cartemquin Film, Gordon Quinn, is with us this week. Yes. Uh, this is a heavyweight here in the Chicago film scene. In the film scene, period. Period. I agree. Um, not to belittle him at all. I, I, you're right. Completely. In the film scene in general. But here in Chicago, to have a studio as unique and as revolutionary as, as Cartemquin. As impactful. Uh, yes. As impactful. Uh, they have made a series of documentaries going back 50 years. It's just truly amazing it really is and it's funny just doing cinema jaw for the time that we've been doing it having various people on from cartemquin which we thought was really neat and then getting filmmakers on um, we had becky on and now to finally have gordon on is is really a, a treat for us it sure is yes um so gordon will be sitting in on this jaw he is going to not necessarily maybe have his own five but he's going to comment on our five picks. How's that sound? What a better commentator, frankly. I agree. Uh, Besides that, we got a whole lot more going on, don't we, Phil? Yeah, we sure do. We're also going eye for an eye on Black Panther. And we have a review of The Cloverfield Paradox. Ooh, nice. And since we are going eye for an eye on Black Panther, I thought this would be a good time to play animal title movie trivia. Oh, I see what you did there. Nice. Panther, yeah. right. Yourself versus Gordon in trivia there. Sounds good. Sounds good. Did you see that um, the director of Wolverine made news recently? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's that guy's name? Mangold. James? James. James Mangold. Yeah. yeah. He, he was in the news coming out saying that post credit scenes, enough already. Yeah. Yeah. He made a little comment. I think he's dead wrong. you got to be joking. No. No. I know that you, you already are... are Bored of the the post credit scenes. You're no. wondering. Yes, you commented to me before. You are. I know. At one I point, you're like, been. you're like trying to find out apps if anything's uh, if if there's a post credit scene. I don't want to sit there if it's not there. I know you're annoyed by these already. No, 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 no. I do use an app to find out, but I love it. I'm annoyed as hell. I think we've seen enough of the post credit scenes. I think we should do a cinema war on this. Cinema, cinema war. war. You're going down. I don't know. Hey. I think your winning streak is uh, no, no. at risk here. No, it's no. at jeopardy. Five in a row. I'm going for six, Matt. I Dave. don't know. Yes. Uh, plus, Matt, this is the first Cinema Jaw we are recording in the month of February. Happy February, Rye. Happy February. And you know what that means. We promised the Jawheads a brand new riddle each and every month. We did. We started off last January with this riddle. I have been in a romantic comedy with Julia Roberts. The following year, I was in my only Woody Allen film. I played multiple roles in a film which Tom Hanks did the same. I have played Meryl Streep's husband, been in a Christmas movie that has a large cast, and played a guy who lives off royalties from a Christmas song his dad wrote. Who am I? We heard from numerous jawheads, and one of them is a big fan of the show, and we call him out every once in a while matt flicker joe wrote in he doesn't do the riddles all that often 
Flicker Joe. But January Riddle, he knew this one. He nailed it. Yeah, he writes in, I was surprised this was the first Riddle of the year because the only thing I initially took away from it was that the actor was definitely in Cloud Atlas. Personal plug, it's one of his favorite movies. Uh, But Julia Roberts, he did Notting Hill with. Woody Allen, he did Small Time Crooks with. Multiple roles with Tom Hanks in Cloud Atlas. Meryl Streep's husband, the quirky Florence Foster Jenkins, large cast movie being Love Actually, and the Xmas song coming from About a Boy. The answer to January's riddle is the delightful Hugh Grant. That is correct. Flicker Joe goes on to say, keep up the great show, guys. Hope this year in cinema is as good as last. Flicker Joe. Thank you, Flicker Joe. Thank you, Flicker Joe. That is correct. It was Hugh Grant was the answer to the January riddle. So let me reach into the hat here and pick out a winner. And the winner is Larson Seaver of Marquette University. At least that's where he's writing in, or wrote in from, Marquette University. Larson Seaver, uh, write us feedback at cinnamonjaw.com. Give us your address, and we will mail out a prize pack. Well done, Larson. There you go. Uh, Matt, here it is. I, I actually uh, I like to let people know Matt wrote this riddle. And, and I told him, don't make it as hard as that Sigourney Weaver one in December. No, this it's, is still, it's still early in the year, is. so we try to make it a little easier. So without further ado, get a pen and paper handy. Here is your February riddle. One dozen primates with tails have I known, though I didn't travel through time with them. Although I've been around for a good long while, I feel like I'm just a beginner. That said, like a fine wine, I seem to get even better with age. These awards prove it. There's no escaping my trap when I sing, I'm the captain. Who am I? If you know the answer to the February riddle, write us. Feedback at cinemajaw.com. Let us know where you're writing in from. We'd like to know where the jawheads uh, are listening to us from. Indeed. Good luck. You can maybe win a prize pack. Yeah, and they're cool stuff. Yeah. Remember to read that riddle again at the end of the jaw. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. All right. I'll write myself a little reminder. There you go. All right, before we get to Gordon, let's get to Eye for an Eye this week. Switch things up. Okay, I like it. Yeah. Phil, what do we got for Eye for an Eye? Yeah, Eye for an Eye, Black Panther. After the events of Captain America's Civil War, King T'Challa returns home to the reclusive, technologically advanced African nation of Wakanda to serve as his country's new leader. However, T'Challa soon finds that he is challenged for the throne from factions within his own country. When two foes conspire to destroy Wakanda, the hero known as Black Panther must prevent Wakanda from being dragged into a world war. The film stars Chadwick Boseman, Michael B. Jordan, and Lupita Nyong'o. It is directed by Ryan Coogler, who previously directed Creed and Fruitvale Station. Rye, we throw it over to you. Am I the only person not excited for this movie? I mean... Everybody seems to be pumped up for Black Panther. And again, it's just really comes down to the factor that I'm not that excited for comic book movies in general. But Ryan Coogler, the two films that I have seen, Creed, Fruitvale Station, Phil named them, excellent. Cast, very exciting. I have to admit, I don't think I knew Black Panther, the character, until when did he uh, pop up in the Avenger universe? The, the last movie was the first time. That's probably the first time I've ever heard of the Black Panther. So I don't know uh, the character at all. Very, very slight interested, really because of who's making the movie and the cast, but but not because it's a superhero movie. I, Matt, we know where you stand. Yeah, we do. I'm going to keep this really short. This is an important movie. Uh, it, it's, it's in the same vein as uh, Wonder Woman as far as... Um, showing uh, that superheroes are not just white men. Uh, I, I, I think for that reason alone, it's a landmark. Um, plus, all the buzz around this is great. And yes, I love Marvel movies, so I am interested. Phil? I, uh, I'm with Matt, exactly, big time. Uh, one, it's about damn time. This movie should have been around. I mean, he's such an important Avenger. I, I think any comic book fan, I, I think he should have been in there since the first movie, wow. quite frankly. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and the character has been around since the 60s, the civil rights movement. It, sure. It, an important comic book as well. Oh, I, it's, I, it's just my ignorance to the comic book movies is all I'm pointing yeah, out It's here. okay, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, you should read more comic books. Yeah. Now, Matt, you might I learned something. I, I know, uh, Matt, you are going to have a review for us on the next show. Oh, I can't wait. I don't know if I'm going to get to that screening, but I will also hint that I am sneaking Phil in to an animated film um, that we also have a screening to, which is Early Man. And oh, this is by yeah. the same people who brought us the great Wallace and Gromit films, or film at least. Um, Curse of the Were Rabbit. That's just films. There's also the Wrong Trousers. But those are shorts, aren't they? No, Wrong Trousers was the feature. Like. Oh, it was. Okay. I, I, I'm not positive. But I know I love Curse of the Were Rabbit. So me and Phil will have a review of Early Man, at least, if I don't see Black Panther. Okay. But we got the Jawheads covered. Yeah, we got them covered. Yeah. So, Matt, as you mentioned, this, this is really an honor here. Joining us this week on Cinema Jaw, artistic director and founding member of Cartemquin Films right here in Chicago, which is a treasure, right? It is. It really it is. It is an honor to welcome Gordon Quinn to Cinema Jaw. Glad to be here. And uh, we were talking a little bit before we started recording. You just got back from Sundance. Yeah, we had a very uh, exciting week at Sundance. I think probably the most exciting week we've ever had out there. Uh, we had two projects that we were premiering, Steve James's multi-part series about uh, Oak Park River Forest High School, which we now know because the sale was announced while we were at Sundance is going to premiere on Stars. That's awesome. Uh, and then uh, Bing Liu is there with his new film, our youngest filmmaker, uh, called Mining the Gap, which is set in Rockford, and it's about these young men who skateboard, and it deals with various kinds of social issues uh, and the most spectacular kind of coming of age, domestic violence, various kind of things come into it as you see these young men grow up uh, and their passion for skateboarding. Wow. So That's it was, it, and, and the film got just a lot of buzz, great reviews actually won the Emerging Filmmaker Award. Wow. So we're there at Sundance, all this stuff is happening, and of course before we left Sundance, we heard that two other films of ours, Abacus and Edith and Eddie, had been nominated for Academy Awards in the sh doc shorts and documentary category. Yeah, yeah. congratulations Big. on the Academy Award nominations. Now is that something, I don't know how that works when it comes to the documentaries, um, Obviously, you were executive producer on Abacus. Right. W would this be something that you would go to with Steve James? Uh, I will probably go out there. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. But, yeah, I will probably go to the, uh, the Academy Awards. That's pretty exciting stuff. I've, I've never been before. Steve was there once with Hoop Dreams yeah. because we got a, a nomination for editing, but right. not for Best oh. Documentary, which was a bit of a scandal at the time. Yeah, we're, we're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> um, but let's start uh, back in the beginning because, uh, obviously, all the success of Cartem Quinn now, especially um, busier and busier with young filmmakers and sort of a new generation, a new voice, in documentary films, but we go back, Cartemquin started when, 45 years ago? 50, over oh 50. Goodness. Last last year, 2016 was our, our uh, 50th anniversary. And we really were three guys out of the University of Chicago, a Carter, a Temner, and a Quinn. Uh, Cartemquin, we thought it sounded like Potemkin, the great famous Russian movie. Sure. Bad idea, never put your names together. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I think it's good, <laughs> that's, it that's, works. That's how we began. Very few people actually get the reference. But we quickly evolved into a collective in the 60s uh, and late 60s. Uh, and, you know, half of the group were teachers and union organizers. The other half were people from media and film. And we were trying to change the world and make the revolution, you know, back in that period. And by the end of the 70s, that had sort of dissipated and fallen apart. But we continue to make documentaries. There was a core group that was still around. And now we have, have evolved, really, into a full-blown media arts organization. We have you know, various programs for young filmmakers and, and a diversity program. And uh, you know, we're 501c3. We're, we've transformed ourselves once again. Yeah, and that's what's what's really interesting because it's a nonprofit. Everything, and it's a very successful studio at this point. Everything goes right back into the art with all these programs and stuff. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And we we actually raise money now, you know, for our various programs. So that's good. now it doesn't seem so far fetched when people are into documentaries, but it seems back then it wasn't quite nearly as popular as it was 
you know, or is today. So what, what drew you to documentary early on? I, I got interested when I was still at the University of Chicago, and at that point, they had no production courses there. Now they do. Judy Hoffman actually teaches. She was part of our collective, and she now teaches documentary production at the University of Chicago, which is amazing to me, because when I was there, it was like, God forbid you should do anything with your hands, you know. But I got very interested in it and saw the potential for it to make social change, to make films around social justice, and started, I really learned on the job. I learned it as an apprentice, working for other people while I was still a student. So you've, you've stayed in Chicago. Yeah. And I'm sure probably many points during your career, uh, you've had to go to LA just because of the business of making films. But why, why keep it here? Why, why is Cartemquin well, connected to Chicago? Early on, when we founded Cartemquin, there were a lot of pressures uh, to move to one coast or the other, particularly to the East Coast, to Boston or New York, because we, were, we wanted to do documentaries. We wanted to do social issue documentaries. Public television was a natural outlet. And at that time, there really was no not much happening in Chicago. After college, I did go and work. Howard was working in New York, and I was still kind of apprenticing with him, so I went and worked on a, a film called Festival about the Newport Folk Festival and some other films in New York. Sure. But I always intended to come back to Chicago. Interesting. And uh, so that brings us to the, the rise of, of Steve James and this a wonderful movie you've already alluded to. Um, and of course, we have listeners uh, not just in Chicago and around the country, but frankly, the world, that might not be aware of how big of a deal this was when Hoop Dreams in 1994, Roger Ebert and, and Gene Siskel both named it their favorite movie of the year. A, that almost never happens. Um, later, Ebert would go on to say it was the best movie of the entire decade of the 1990s. Very high praise. And they had a voice that they, they wanted it not only to just get best documentary at the Oscars, Ebert was pushing for best picture. Best picture, yeah. And a lot of people were starting to think it had the momentum that it was going to become the first documentary to be nominated for best picture. And the Academy not only snubs it for best picture, it doesn't even get nominated for best documentary. Yeah. Yeah. And all hell literally broke loose. <laughs> yeah, it, w it was a huge story. And we were there in Cartemquin, you know, in our building at 6 in the morning as the announcement comes out. And all the press is there with the cameras trained on us, oh, you man. know, because they were waiting for it to happen. Uh, it did get a nomination for, for editing. But, you know, Hoop Dreams was a huge breakthrough. And then to come full circle, you have Roger Ebert, who really championed the film. And here Steve James comes back with Life Itself. Yeah. Again, I mean, wow, a this wonder, movie a wonderful me film up. I mean, too. yes. Excellent. No, that was and, – and, you know, it was very much, you know, it's not an easy film. There's stuff about his illness and some stuff that's very hard to take in Life Itself. And Roger wanted that in the movie. Roger was like, you're going to make a movie about me. It has to be honest. It has to deal with the hard stuff. He made sure that that was going to be a part of the film. He yeah. didn't want anything whitewashed. Uh, you know, speaking of all the, the social issues, that brings us up to one of your recent projects, uh, the Boycott 63 film. Uh, which I had the pleasure of watching. Yeah, I got to check it out as well. Uh, 25 years in the making? Is that no, 50. 50 years. Yeah. Over, okay. 63, Over 50. do 63. the math. 1963, right. right. <laughs> right. And I wish I'd had it done in 2013 for the 50th anniversary. We actually did have a version of it that we showed at a big event at the DuSable Museum right on the 50th anniversary of the boycott. Yeah. It's awesome. And it was funny, uh, Gordon, right before we had hit the record button, Matt, Gordon had told me some of the archival footage that we see yeah. was shot by Gordon in oh, 1963. Yeah. We, we shot it when we, Temner and I, and we brought Shay into it. We had a whole Stan Carter. We had all these people out shooting because we had heard, you know, Al Raby and other people uh, had tipped us off that this incredibly important uh, Don Rose was another one event was going to be happening. And they wanted it filmed. They wanted it recorded for history. And then I, at the time, I made a short little piece that was about eight minutes long, and it, it wasn't even sunk up. You know, I would go with an old Wallensack recorder and a regular film projector with the splices and everything, and I'd just start them together and hope for the best, you know, and, and had some wow. music with it. 
and I went around with Al Raby because we, they were using it for organizing, you know, to, to keep the pressure on the school system. Yeah, yeah. and for, for the listeners who don't know, this is about the 1963 um, boycott of the Chicago public school system where all the students stayed home to protest uh, 250, segregation. 250,000 students stayed out of school. There was a huge march downtown from all different parts of the city because it, they were protesting the, they were putting trailers behind the overcrowded black schools right. so they wouldn't have to move those kids into the underutilized adjacent white schools. So it was a real civil rights demonstration, and they wanted to get rid of this uh, racist school superintendent, uh, Benjamin Willis, and eventually they did, although not right, <coughs> sorry, not right after the, the boycott. Took a little but, while. Yeah, but I had this footage all these years, and I offered it to Eisen the prize. I kept saying, someone should tell this story. And finally, as the 50th anniversary was approaching, I realized, okay, I'm going to have to tell it. And we actually used the web, and we had 500 still photographs taken from the footage. We found those people, some through the, our I website. Was, I was going to ask, like, how did you reconnect with some of those we, subjects? We, some of them we knew because they had been leaders in the thing. But what we did was we had all these still photographs on our website, and it was like Facebook. You can, you know, there'd be 20 people in a shot, but you could click on somebody's face and a little just like Facebook you just leave us your information and say that's me or I know this person and so we tracked down these people wow. 50 years later and interviewed them and then interwove that with that old historical footage that we had shot and then framed it with the current school closing issues because things haven't changed that much they, they really haven't I mean uh, and Sad just to say yeah just to see you know I'm sure other cities around the country have the same issue where, where the money, uh, they were going over the school budgets and, and not getting the proper funds to some of these inner city schools. It's, and it's like, it, it's got to be terrific. This has got to be a joke at this point. No, are, are, aren't have, we, aren't yeah. we more mature than this? Yeah. And one final question is how the filmmakers come to Kartemquin. Um, I'm always interested in that because I think you guys have such a varied voice over sure. there of different filmmakers making various subjects. Um, and bringing them to life. How, do people come to you with pitches? How does all that work? Well, we're filmmaker-driven, so it's not like we sit around and say, oh, this would be a good idea for a film. Let's go find somebody to make it, which is how I think some studios work. Sure. We are really looking to be the place, like the guys who made Hoop Dreams, like Maria Finitsu, you know, who they, this is a story they feel is really important. They have a passion to tell it. It's kind of the film that they have to make. And Kartemkin is the place for that. And so people do come to us with a pitch or with, you know, uh, you know, they want to get involved with us. And we don't, we're not funders, so they're going to still have to raise the money. We're looking for people, and this is not for everybody, who really want that collaborative relationship who really want to work with us creatively. We do advise people about fundraising. We advise them about distribution and impact and how to get their film out into the world. But we want people, you know, who, who really want that interaction. We spend a lot of time with people in the editing rooms and a lot of what I do now, excuse me, a lot of what I do now is work with uh, filmmakers in the editing room. Mm -hmm. That's great. So yeah. What's what's coming down the pipe? What's next? Um, Queen? Well, Maria has this new film, uh, Dilemma of Desire, about yes. women in, and sexuality. And when's that coming out? Uh, probably a year from now. She's still raising money. <laughs> uh, so I think she's got a, a ways to go. Uh, we have... This could be an interesting moment, uh, you for know, that. sociopolitically. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> no, it's no question about it, you know. And um, it's, a, it's a very important film. And that's... You know, often these things you, you, you realize, oh, we were a little ahead of the curve on that. That's great. I just came here from a fundraiser for a film that Hillary uh, Baxell is doing called Represent, which is about women running for office, you know, and all these down ballot. It, and as I'm pulling up to Maria's where we had the benefit, uh, I'm listening to NPR and they're talking about all these women who are running for office and how it's this phenomenon. Hillary's been working on the film for a year already, you know, and it's been following women who are running for, you know, uh, county commissioner, a state legislator, sure. uh, you know, all these down ballot kind of things. So that's an exciting project that we have in the works, yeah. And um, the one I mentioned, Bing Lu's film, is about to be released. That'll be on POV 
uh, and also in theaters. That'll get a theatrical release. Awesome. That's great. Uh, for the jawheads, we call them, our listeners uh, that want to find out more about Cartemquin Films, uh, the best place to do so online is? At cartemquinfilms.com. It's K-A-R-T-E-M as in Mary, Q-U-I-N as in Nancy, dot com. And, you know, go to our website. We actually, you can become a member of Cartemquin and get a lot of extra information uh, uh, that you can... Uh, you know, at certain levels, you can literally get access to all of our films online. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so there's different membership tiers, and we have a lot of screenings and, you know, events of different kinds around the city and also nationally and internationally. You know, we talked about Chicago earlier, and it's like we are Chicago-based, we are Midwestern, and that is true you know, that those subjects are in a lot of our films, but we've also made films all over the world. We're not limited to it. And I, our audience is all over the world. I like to think that we bring Midwestern sensibilities to an international audience. Well said. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. A quick story. I've, I've been to the website, and I, I would encourage listeners, just join the email list. Yeah. They, they did this fantastic thing during the 50th anniversary. They were releasing a, um, a film each week. So I got to watch a lot of the back catalog. Yeah. It, it was it was fantastic, Hugh. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. Now we like to end all of our interviews, Gordon, with some silly cinema cues. We call them. Get to know the guests through the eye of the lens. Phil, you got something for Gordon? I do. I actually have two questions for you, Gordon. Uh, so the first one, you were actually the cinematographer. You filmed the footage for Boycott '63, uh, and I have to imagine that would have been pretty amazing to have seen in person. Uh, are there any other documentaries that have come out that you are jealous of for not being able to have seen in person and, and shoot yourself? <coughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the, the family in Steve's film, Abacus, yeah. the Chinese family, mm -hmm. is such an amazing family. I would have loved to have spent time with them. Uh, and I always had that, you know, when I watch it, it's like, God, I wish I was there. Um, the film that really <coughs> that inspired me to get into movies, the one that I saw where it was like, I saw it when I was a student at the University of Chicago. It's called Happy's Mother's Day, and it's about the birth of the quintuplets in Fargo, North Dakota. And it was done by Ricky Leacock and Joyce uh, Chopra. Yeah. And when I saw that film, it was like, you know, Ricky Leacock shot it. It was like, God, I wish I was there, you know, Just seeing a, that a great and, story. and oh, shooting shit. it. Yeah. But there is there is something that happens when you shoot where you're it, it's happening in front of the camera and you just get in this zone and you're not even thinking you're just experiencing <laughs> another question phil awesome yeah uh this one is a lot sillier uh so at the beginning of the interview you had mentioned that it's a bad idea to uh use names use a couple of different names and, and smush them into one if Cinema Jaw was to rebrand and come up with a new name for itself, oh, here we go. What two movie stars do you think would be the best worst idea to mash up? Oh, to to mash up. That's that's. Uh, well, let's see. That's a tough one. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, term Terma Lee, maybe. Term, you know, or uh, what's her name? Termin. Uh, Who's the star that I'm thinking of? Oh, Uma Thurman. Thurman Thurman. Uma Thur Thurman. Thurman Lee. Yeah, Thurman, Thurman, Thurman Lee, Lee and, and Spike Lee, who is not only a director, but also has starred in some of his own movies. Yeah. True. Actually, Thurman that's Lee. So there you go. Write that one down, Phil. Yeah. No, that's the best I can do. I like it. That is actually pretty good. It really is. Yeah. And, and while um, I'm thinking of it, I did want to give a plug to Abacus. Small Enough to Jail is available now on Amazon Prime. I just caught it this weekend. I know you had already uh, previously seen it. Yes. And highly recommend checking it out. Uh, of course, it's, it's, it, we've mentioned Steve James numerous times on the show. So if it's a Steve James movie and it's nominated for Best Documentary of the Year, please do yourself a favor and, and check it's it a, out. And it's a really important film. I mm -hmm. mean, it's fun. It's funny. It's emotional. You know, you laugh. You cry. Mm -hmm. It's all those things that a, that a great feature film delivers. And it's also really about something important. It sure Agreed. is. Yep. Yeah. So Gordon, in, Gordon is sitting in on this entire jaw. We're, we're going to talk about our impactful documentaries that have really made a 
difference. Sure. Some documentaries, like you say, are, are funny or just interesting, and some really hit you. You know, they wallop yeah. you. So Gordon is sitting in on this entire job. Before we get to talking about documentaries, impactful documentaries, there is a new movie out on Netflix. And let me say this, Matt. Back in 2008, the original Cloverfield came out and with a great marketing campaign that left us all wondering what it was about, it launched one of the better found footage films. Then two years ago, we got 10 Cloverfield Lane completely different, and one we were not sure until the end was even related to the first. Now, Cloverfield Paradox comes out of virtually nowhere and is available to stream on Netflix with no prior knowledge that the film was even even being made. Matt and I hit the stream button to see if this lived up to the first two. Three. Three. Morning, beautiful. Two. 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 I'm getting sick of only seeing you on a screen. One. 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 Please, God. <laughs> Be on our side. Standing by for your go. Turn that shit up. Fingers crossed. It's gone. It's big, blue, full of angry people. Keep looking, you'll find it. My God. I guess one cool thing about this unconventional series, and a good place to start, is that the original Cloverfield sits second in the timeline, with the Cloverfield Lane being a sequel, and this new one, Cloverfield Paradox, being a prequel. The premise of the film is set up in the first five minutes. The earth is running dangerously low on natural resources. So low that in about five years time, they will be completely out. So the plan is to send an international crew into space where they will attempt to use a massive particle accelerator in order to create energy for the entire planet for years to come. This is a dangerous mission as scientists are still not sure what all can happen if something goes wrong or actually, even if something goes right on this large of scale. After many months worth of attempts and failures, the crew has success. What happens next is the best part of the story. The Earth disappears. That's right, like a David David Copperfield trick, the Earth is gone. The astronauts see the Earth out their window one minute and the next, gone. From here, many strange things start to happen on board the spacecraft. Some of this was confusing, some shocking, and some disgusting. Can they make things right again? Matt, I will admit, there were some fun aspects to Paradox. Also, as I mentioned, when the Earth disappeared, I was intrigued. However, from that point on, the script started to fall apart. For starters, they tried to lace too much humor into it. Chris O'Dowell, who I really like, sitting there ends up uh, sitting there making fun of his severed arm while it's moving on its own too much humor secondly i was puzzled at times with what exactly was going on such as when they find a woman behind a panel on the ship the crew members eventually get separated and bad things happen predictable sci-fi horror if you will the skiers in the film though do not really shock me or get me to jump off my couch I feel it really dropped the ball here in regards to being a smart sci-fi film. The premise was there, but the script and ultimately the movie did not follow through. Matt, where do you sit with Cloverfield Paradox? There's, There's two things we have to talk about when we talk about the Cloverfield Paradox. First of all, you're wrong about the timeline. This is actually a sequel. It happens in 2028, I believe. What? Yeah, and the first Cloverfield movie took place during early cell phone years, so I think 2008, 2009, I think it was when it was set. But here's the thing. The Cloverfield paradox itself is about other dimensions and timelines. Right. So it doesn't matter. It it sends things to the past, the present, and even other dimensions. But you're telling me, I always thought, I I took away that this was how the monster That's or true. would have came yes. in the original Cloverfield. So in Absolutely a way, true. it's a prequel. It's not. It's, well, I mean, uh, temporally, chronologically speaking, it happens in the future. Hmm. 
but what happened in Cloverfield is still a result of what happened in the future rippling into the past, if that's not too much of a brain bender. But it doesn't matter. Listen, the movie itself was okay. It was decent at best. There's some cool things. I did really like the intrigue and mystery, the earth is missing, the arms moving by itself, somebody's vomiting worms. Uh, they, they, get a, they get a message from the severed arm, which I thought was actually a pretty genius bit of exposition. That was pretty good. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed that. But, but, but you just mentioned the worms. There, that, there's a scene, for instance, where the worms disappear, and then later on a character pukes up found the, the worms, worms, Yeah, and there's that line, yeah. found the worms, a little too much, come on. Uh, oh, I agree. Listen, this movie is a mess, is a mess in many, many ways. It, when I'm saying it's okay, I'm kind of being generous. Um, it, it, but when I said there's two things we need to talk about here, it's not so much w- w- what the movie was, as far as much as it's how the movie was delivered because how the movie was delivered is the reason we will be talking about this movie the rest of the time we do cinema jaw i mean it's going to be something we're talking about no. for years see and i think you're wrong on that you I, I saw you had uh put something out on twitter to give me an idea of thinking about this i mean we're talking about netflix and the future of streaming i i think we're going to see more of this in the future oh yeah think well, yeah, and I don't think it's that much of a stretch that this was like some landmark. I almost would say, well, this was coming eventually. It's not like, for instance, like the Blair Witch Project or something that was right. marketed so ingenious. Like this is like, well, yeah, the writing was on the wall that this was eventually going to happen where, bam, all of a sudden there's a movie on this, Netflix. No, 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 no. You, wow, you are underselling this so vastly. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, this not. is the first time. You're too excited about it. No, yes, ostensibly, you are. This, yes, is you are. A, this is a tentpole blockbuster, right? J.J. Uh, Abrams attached to it. You got um, the the villain from uh, what, what is that guy's name? The German guy who plays Schmidt in the movie, uh, Jawbox. He's great, by the way. So so some familiar faces. The point is, is a, a tentpole blockbuster that that went from trailer to streamable in three hours. Never been done before. It was complete showmanship, a, a marketing masterstroke, and now. They literally own your eyeballs after the Super Bowl from here to eternity. Netflix just bought. No. Oh, are you kidding me? No. This was the water cooler who, movie who of watched, the year. How many people watched it after the Super Bowl? Tons. You didn't. Tons. Did you, you didn't? Are, yes, I did. You didn't watch it till the next day. That's because I didn't watch the Super Bowl. Let's be honest here. But as soon as I went to Twitter that night, I saw everybody. Oh, I'm watching the the Cloverfield, Cloverfield Paradox. Cloverfield Paradox. Cloverfield Paradox. All over Twitter, it blew up. Everybody was like, who cares about the football game? I can't wait to see Cloverfield Paradox. And, and here we are talking about it. It's, it's not so much about the movie as much as it was about the way they delivered it, which is going to change the industry. Okay. Well, we can argue on that. I, I, I think overall, I would say this is the first bad turn of the series. Now, that's true. for the fourth film, I wouldn't be all that excited. I think the whole thing was to sort of see how this all manifested itself and it comes down to this ending moment where there's a reveal just in case someone hasn't watched the movie we won't give that away but there is a reveal in the last uh, few moments of this movie that sort of explains maybe something about the first and it's like eh, that was the whole build up for that if I looked at the movie as a whole to get to that build up F I, I didn't like it oh I agree I mean they, they really had a crappy film on their hands they knew it uh, and they found a way out. They found a way out that, that made this crappy, forgettable movie into something that we will be forced to discuss the before and after Cloverfield Paradox for the rest of our movie-going lives. Hmm. All right, so it sounds like uh, there's a lot that they did wrong, so let's start with what they did right. What are some favorite scenes you guys have? Um, two. One that I mentioned already, which was the Earth disappearing. That's pretty cool. Pretty awesome. I mean, the, the whole concept there is is rather we smart. We lost the earth. Yeah. It's so weird. Like, I just never seen anything like that. So that was pretty cool. Um, but I, I haven't done this since we've been doing the five questions. My, my favorite scene is also my worst scene. Could that possibly be? Well, but, it's the Cloverfield Paradox, right? <laughs> Anything's possible. So I'm actually going to knock my best and worst scene off in one shot here. Go for okay? it. Okay. And it is this scene where one character gets trapped in an airlock and 
water for some reason starts to pour into the airlock. Yeah, because so, that's a thing. Right. So that's why it's my worst scene. Why would there be water pouring into this airlock? We're, we're talking about a hatch getting ready to go out into space, and this water is just pouring in. Right. It's not a water lock. I have no idea. I couldn't even understand or fathom, or if they even tried to explain why this water was coming into an airlock. Bonkers. I don't know what that was about, but it does end with my favorite scene of the movie, which is the fact that the water is getting to be so heavy, it's just going to knock the door out into space. And you see this is that, and, and that's even never would happen for that small of an airlock. I don't even want to get into the technicals, but the weight of that water wouldn't have opened that. I don't know if it was the weight door. of the water, but whatever. Yeah. And eventually the water opens up into space, and it's that shot of as soon as that door opened. It just sort of freezing and killing her instantly, and the water freezing. That was awesome. That was really awesome. That yeah, because you expect that she's going to get sucked out into space, but exactly. it, it doesn't but quite happen that way. It, because it's so damn cold that as soon as that opened, everything just... Yeah. That was pretty cool. That was cool. But again, what a stupid premise to get her into that situation. Right, right. I mean, if it was like fire control, you'd think they would just use gas. And plus, it's an airlock. You just open the door, <laughs> so there goes your fire. Don't think about this movie. Uh, yeah, Definitely. <laughs> Uh, favorite scene for me was the message from the arm. Think like uh, basically like the thing from Adam's family. So weird, so weird. And that reveal was probably the best reveal in the movie. When when they get the message from the arm, trouble with scene uh, for me. Okay, you didn't mention this. So the main character, our, our surrogate, is Gugu Mbatha Raw. And she has this scene in the beginning with her husband, and they're in a car. And it starts out with this. First of all, it's like a shaky cam, and Really, it wasn't, like, used for effect. Like, this is found footage, like somebody with a cell phone. It's just, like, bad camera work, I guess. And then they have this really ham-fisted, forced exchange that just... It, it's terribly scripted, terribly delivered. It's flat. It's terrible. Hated it. Hated it. Right from the opening seconds of the movie. So that was... Not a good way to start. <laughs> no, not a good way to start. It did get a little better from there. Obviously, uh, the two Cloverfield films prior, but what uh, do you guys have as influences? I went with a far superior film when it comes to opening up different dimensions, or at least the fact that there may be other dimensions, and that's Coherence. That's that movie where the people are in one yeah. house. Yeah, and that's a good one. It you, is. I didn't think of that one. That's good. I've talked about that one on Cinema Jaw. And then also, believe it or not, Life, which I brought up with Jake Gyllenhaal, where, again, they're trying to experiment with life right outside the Earth on the International Space Station. Very similar premise there. Yeah, I think you're being too kind. Alien, obviously, uh, very much so in their uniforms and the design of the, the interiors of the ship. Event Horizon, with all the, the horror aspects mm -hmm. and stuff. Here, Speaking of being too kind, there's a tiny bit of uh, Space Odyssey 2001 in there. Just a, a little touch of it. Wow. Yeah, maybe, maybe. It's mm -hmm. there enough, but again, it's more derivative than a compliment. All right, well, what did you guys learn? Cloverfield's going to have a few more sequels. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't positive that after 10 Cloverfield Lane, there was even going to be another Cloverfield. But now, even after this one, I'm sure we're going to see another two or three. They may go direct to Netflix constantly now, but there'll be more. Oh, yes, there will be more. What I learned was one of the best marketing moves of all time. That's what I learned. This cannot be understated. We witnessed a title shift in the film industry. Don Draper would laugh at this. No, Don Draper would be counting his money because he would have been the guy doing it. <laughs> Whoever did this right now is being lauded as a genius. I've got to find out who did this. Don Draper. Maybe. <laughs> all right, guys, last one, movie poster quotes. What do you got? Sometimes sloppy, sometimes fun. What a paradox. I was going to say none because there are no posters in Netflix, Netflix's future. But I'll say the paradox is how they took a forgettable movie and made it into one that we will still be mentioning in 30 years. All right. Let's assign some jaws here, Matt. I'm going a whopping one and a half jaws. Wow. Yeah. I think you're being kind. It was fun enough for a couch movie. I'd say one and a half. All right. Look at that. We we'll spent too much time talking about Cloverfield. It's, it's, it's a landmark, but not for the right jaw. reasons, right? Yeah. So, Matt, obviously, Cloverfield, Paradox, not a documentary, but because we got Gordon Quinn here, that is our top five this week impactful documentaries. Yes. And we've covered 
documentaries in the past here on we, Cinema Junk. We did, and it's been a while, but the last time we did it was Best Documentaries of the Decade. Right. So this time we've opened it up to all time. Right, and these are impactful documentaries. Could be on society, we think, as a whole, or just impactful to, to us. To oneself, sure. Yeah. Uh, why don't you get us started this week, Matt? Yeah, it's it's that pretty much covers all documentaries. Mm -hmm. They, it, if if only to just yourself, I think a good doc is impactful in some way. So at number five, this is a bit of a cheat, all right? Because I don't know if it's actually considered a documentary, but it's it, it's a very early film, 1896, one of the most famous films of all time. It is the arrival of a train at Le La Ciat. Oh I, I yeah, that's how you pronounce oh, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, impactful almost literally the audience was afraid they were going to be impacted this, by a train this is where they almost jumped out of the way right yeah yeah and i don't know how much of that is like urban legend and how much of that is true it doesn't matter it's 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 legend is almost more important because it's just just such a part of cinema history and it kind of goes to show the power of a film it's it's the best example i think it was featured in the movie hugo it's been in a lot of movies. Uh, I've never seen the, the film itself. Just that highlight of the, the train pulling in. Is that that, that is it? the film. Oh, that is it. Okay. Yeah, I believe <laughs> it was just a, yeah, it was like a newsreel. It was just for the very early days. But, you know, that whole thing of people seeing a film for the first time, there's a wonderful, uh, I think it's a Cuban film. It was definitely made in Cuba, uh, called For the First Time. And it's people were going into the, you know, up into the mountains in Cuba and they'd bring together, they'd show it on a sheet outdoors, and they would show like a Chaplin film. And what the film is, is the faces and the response of people seeing a movie for the first time. Wow. It, it's in a spectacular film. Wow, yeah. that is great. Yeah, nice. Um, swings it over to my number five, and, and, and hopefully uh, we've all seen this one. It came out in 2008. In fact, I think you have seen this one, Matt. Um, it, it, this one really walloped me because I think you see a lot of news stories when there's natural disasters around the world, and I always would think to myself, uh, ignorant old me, thinking, boy, glad I grew up in the United States and in, in America. This isn't going to happen to me. And then lo and behold, uh, Katrina hit here in the United States in 2008, a wonderful and, and actually shocking and impactful documentary came out entitled Trouble the Water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a great film. It, it explores issues, again, with race, class, relationships, families. Um, and what you have here is some actual footage uh, that is shot on a, a phone of one of the uh, girls who's part of this family that was actually trapped inside their house during uh, Katrina. And then you see the aftermath. And it, it is, uh, there's this one uh, moment where these people walk up to, it's what basically is an army base, yeah. to try to get clean water and are turned away. And it's sickening. And it's, it's so saddening because to realize that that can happen in, in our country, in our backyard, uh, really, I remember it really hit me hard. And I, very, I love this movie. Yeah, very powerful film. Yeah. I love that movie. I love that movie too, man. That is a great pick. Yeah. Definitely, um, definitely pissed me off. Yes, no doubt. I mean, you talk about you want to take action, right? And and a movie like that springs you out. You I, all of a sudden say, well, how can I help? Because I'm sitting here on my couch doing nothing myself, and that gets me angry enough to want to help. And so that's a good thing. And plus, yeah. I, I like to think that it changed, made some change by, by creating an accountability for, you know, the government, FEMA, organizations like this who, who are responsible for responding. We would hope so, but we look would. what just happened in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. you know, which is still happening still in happens. Puerto Rico. It's still kind happening. Of incredibly outrageous. Mm -hmm. True. So that brings it around to my number four, and this is where I put 2013's Blackfish. Um, jumping into the modern era. Definitely impactful. A lot of sea worlds, I think, have closed at this point. I, I was about to say, I think they, they're on the, the verge of Chapter 11. Um, is that true? I think so. Yeah, Throw I just job box. Will I you? just, just heard a report it. on uh, NPR. I actually think they're gone. They wow. may be. I think you, you, they they were, but I think I think they certainly don't have. I'm almost. I could have this wrong. You got to mm -hmm. fact check it, but I don't think they have or the orcas anymore. Wow. And I think they were close to going out of business. Yeah, and uh, this this film, it, it's not tough to imagine why after you watch Blackfish. Um, I, I said how much trouble the water pisses pissed me off. This one pissed me off almost equally. I mean, it's it's not, it's almost worse than seeing something horrible happen to a human being because the animals, for some reason, seem so innocent. 
Uh, they have no say in the matter. And oh my God, it's just heartbreaking when you see what what Goes happened on. to these to these orca. Oh my God, yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's a good one. I, I've had uh, the fortunate. Um, chance of going out and whale watching off the coast of Vancouver and what a beautiful if I had to say some of the most beautiful moments of my life was out there you know out in the ocean seeing these humongous you know creatures come out of the sea and it's so gorgeous and then to watch a movie like Black Fish where you realize what is is happening for the entertainment of you know kids right. and families it's it's sickening so yeah I like that pick good Thanks. pick Matt my number four, I'm, I'm hoping uh, we've seen it. Uh, this came out in 2012, and I think it was a subject matter I, I hadn't really known about, hadn't been on my radar. I'm speaking of the 2012 film, The Invisible War. And this deals with the subject matter of sexual assault in the U.S. military, and not only on women soldiers who serve, but also uh, male soldiers and people who are raped, Detainees and, too, right? Uh, all kinds of m bad behavior in the U.S. military, and it, it deals with uh, talking to a lot of these uh, subjects, who then were in the military, and now the effects of what what that has had on them the rest of their life. It's not something that is ever really able to be, you know, exercised cured. fully. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's 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 really haunting, and I, I think the scope. I think what this movie did was show just what and how big the scope of this problem is that uh, there is in the U.S. military. It's, uh, it's frightening. Uh, all right. That swings it around to my number three. And, guys, we knew this was going to be on the list. I hope I'm not stealing one off of yours, but it is Davis Guggenheim's An Inconvenient Truth. Very, very impactful. And another one, it's sad to say, we're still having this conversation. They just released an inconvenient sequel uh, I believe last year, right? 2017? Yeah. I still haven't seen the sequel. But this one was probably the first major um, climate change discussion that, you know, Al Gore was doing the circuit and um, – this guy, um, the, the filmmaker Guggenheim, sort of uh, followed him around and took the best clips. It was, you know, a lot of, for a lot of people, the very first time they heard all this science. Yeah, and it was a very, it, w it was well-crafted, you know. I mean, the, the uh, Gore had really developed his presentation over time and, excuse me, working with audiences and then the way that they brought in the other footage and material you know, it was very effective. It was. Yeah. And it ended with, uh, I want to say it was Melissa Estridge. Estridge, what's her name? Melissa Estridge? Yeah, Melissa her, I think she sings the song at the end. Throw that in the jaw box. And I remember watching that and just really being moved because it's like, what can I do to, you know, better the planet yeah. in a way, you know? I, 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 I don't want to damage it anymore. I just remember when he goes up on the forklift and he keeps, keeps going up. I mean, he, here's one thing. We, we like to ask five questions after we review a film. What's the one thing you learned? Mm -hmm. That Al Gore could be funny mm -hmm. because he was such a stiff, uh, yeah. you know, like he got made fun of relentlessly on Saturday Night Live, and he was actually really good. It made me like Al Gore mm -hmm. a lot more than I had before. Uh, swings it over to my number three. This one came out in 2014. I think if you've listened to the show um, quite a bit, I've mentioned how much of an impact this movie has had on me personally, and this one... There's a lot of great food documentaries out there talking about, um, you know, the issues we have uh, with, you know, mass uh, production of food. Oh, sure. Yeah. But, boy, this one, I went in and I always uh, joke that one of the most horrific things was going to see this movie and then going to the grocery store and, and looking at, at the nutritional facts after it. I'm speaking of fed up. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Not the one I thought you were going to pick. And this was uh, Katie Couric uh, narrated the film. And it really is attacking uh, sugar and just how much sugar is in processed foods. The, the, uh, the problem that we have with obesity in the country and linking the idea of that we've just got way too much sugar in our food and, and no one's doing anything because, you know, the FDA is, is not even putting the percentage of sugar like they do every other ingredient. The percentage is not listed on that because it would just – be absolutely crazy if you picked up a can of Coke and you looked at the facts and it said 180% of your daily intake of sugar, you might not actually drink that can of Coke. But people are probably drinking five of these Cokes a day. They're well, killing themselves with this stuff. 
as we, as we know in our city, we just had this uh, episode oh. with the soda tax, mm -hmm. which was a good idea, uh, a healthy thing, and the county needed the money. And the soda industry came in and turned it around mm -hmm. and killed it. And it had passed, you know. It was, uh, you know, it was a very gutsy move on Preckwinkle's part, and it was too bad that, you know, the film should have been showing, they should have run it in prime time when the controversy was going on. I agree. I, I mean, I remember right before, a couple of years earlier, actually on, on the Howard Stern show, a doctor had called in and, and said, you know, started going in about big sugar companies and, and how much power that they have that, you know, he was versed, I don't know, he went to Harvard or whatever, and he was talking about, he can't go on shows like the Oprah show or, you know, anywhere near prime time. Because he's censored? Yeah, because the, the, the big sugar companies would pull their ads on, on an Oprah or, or whatever show that would be. Well, look what, look what happened. You know about the thing where Oprah said some things about eating red meat and beef on her show. Right. And she had a huge lawsuit from the Beef Producers Association for like $10 million, you know, whatever it was. It, w it went through the courts for years. Yeah, they really went after her because wow. she, you know, kind of was trying to get people to eat l less red meat. Yeah. And they had a, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's one, it's, it's a health factor, but two, it's, it's interesting to see just how much power these companies have and influences they have over what we're eating and drinking and trying to cover up the fact that we right. Americans are just taking in way too much sugar. There's, there's tobacco industry-like documents that are coming out now that the sugar industry knows that it's killing people, but they're blaming the fats and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. So, I thought you were going to say Food Inc. No. Yeah. L another great one. Uh, yeah. Definitely yeah. another great one. All right. We're into our twos, Matt. All right. Uh, so Michael Moore, right? He's got to be somewhere on here. And what a, a, a great list of films to choose from. I'm going with Bowling for Columbine. And this is where I think it's a personal impact because it, it, it's forced me to think and consider an issue. What I like most about Bowling for Columbine is I don't think it comes down really hard. We were speaking earlier about how documentaries are subjective. It doesn't really come down hard either way on this issue. Uh, obviously, I think... Of gun it, control. Of anyways. gun control, right. right. Uh, it, it most certainly leans... Um, in, in favor of more restrictions. But, uh, you know, Michael Moore himself is a card-carrying member of the, the uh, NRA. NRA, thanks. Uh, which I think he's doing for ironic effect in the film. But nevertheless, it's a difficult question, one we're still dealing with, obviously, in the news, unfortunately, way too often. Um, and this one, I don't know why, it just stuck in my craw, man. I, I couldn't get it out of my head. It's, it's one of his great ones. And he's, I think what he's dealing with there... I mean, he is on clearly on one side of the issue, but he's dealing with the absurdity of the gun lobby. You know what I mean? The bank that's giving out a gun. You open up an account, you get sure. a gun. You know, he's dealing with the the absurdity. You know, where he's not saying no, there is a place for guns. There's hunting. You know, he's he's sympathetic to that, but he's trying to show the incredible power of the gun lobby. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he comes up with a, a good idea, too, that I think, you know, the media is selling us fear. And, and that's another big reason on why we're sort of just gun crazy and maybe violent crazy in, in some, you know, yeah, it's I interesting. Mean, it, the, the most dangerous thing you can do is have a gun in your house. Mm -hmm. That puts you at risk right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's a good one. It's a great movie. Yeah. Um, swings it over to my number two. And this one came out in 2008. Uh, impactful, I, I think, because I, I look back uh, at this event in, in sort of awe that it actually happened. And in a way, the director um, did go on to say that it was a love letter to New York and to the World Trade Center. I'm speaking of the 2008 film Man on Wire. And this tells the story of uh, Felipe Petit, who actually took a high wire and he went across the Twin Towers in New York in 1974. But he wasn't just allowed to do this. It was this, a performance art piece. Yeah, but I mean, it, was, um, it wasn't sanctioned it, by New York. Yeah, he actually it, it, snuck up the towers to yeah. get up there. And then he had to get the, the cable across. And it was just his crew. And, and you know, this, this obviously, this came out in 2008. 
2001. So I think what what really struck me about it was as this the film builds. It's funny. It's it's sort of got this feeling of excitement that he's actually trying to pull this stunt off. But then when it hits that climax and he actually is on the wire in between the two buildings, um, I remember watching it and just a, a tear coming down my, my eye at the beauty of it, like the awe of this moment that he was <coughs> balancing himself on, on a wire between these two marvelous structures in New York. And, and it, the whole moment sort of hit me and it, it must have... It must have hit many a people because this film went on to win the documentary for, I mean, the Oscar for Best Documentary. Uh, really touching film. I, I loved it. You know, I once saw him in New York in a park in Greenwich Village. I can't remember. One of those small parks working on a slack line with just working the street like a street performer. Uh, and he was spectacular. You know, not, it, it wasn't that what he was doing doing in terms of, you know, high wire act. It was the way that he worked the crowd, the way that he created a whole sense of space and excitement about this idea of street performing. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite a moment. That's yeah, cool. Obviously, they went on to make the uh, live adaptation of the movie with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah, was I was going to ask you. Uh, I've never even seen the I, movie. Honestly, the I forget. It's called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have not seen that. There was, you know, the most in interesting thing. I haven't seen it either, to be fair. But one of the things that I remember of, of that film was there was some really cool VR promotions for it where you could go in, in the lobby oh, of movie right. theaters, put on the goggles, and it, you would look like you were walking. That would scare me. Yeah, it looked really scary. <laughs> All right. This is Cinema Jaw Matt, and these are our number one most impactful films. Let's see if we, we can give Gordon a treat here. All right. I think so. Uh, if you have an Orson Welles film... At number one, I think that's a good place to have an Orson Welles film. And this is where I put F for fake. I don't think he gets enough credit for this movie. I mean, obviously everybody thinks Citizen Kane. This is one of the best documentaries of all time, in my opinion. In fact, it might top my list if we ever did favorite documentaries of all time. It's just, first of all, as, as a piece of art, the movie itself, just visually, is very well done, very well edited. I mean, he was just a genius. Uh, and then the subject matter is mind-melting. <laughs> like, he's essentially trying to tell you that, that it's, a, it's a bit like Exit Through the Gift Shop, that everything is fake. Even, even the movie itself, at times, is, is part of the hoax. I mean, and you have to remember that he's the guy that pulled off the War of the Worlds, where everybody believed that the Martians had actually landed. Mm -hmm. So if anyone can tell that story, it's Orson Welles and I think it goes over a lot of people's heads. Maybe that's why it hasn't completely found an audience. But for the people that love it, it's like a, a – I hesitate to say cult classic, but there it is. You a fan of this one, Gordon? Yeah, yeah, I did. I remember seeing it at the time and uh, always been a, a Wells fan. And it was really interesting to see him doing a documentary. Right. Yeah. And dealing with all of the – you know, which now we take for granted – in films, you know, all the meta stuff that is in that film where it's commenting on itself in some kind of way. Yeah, for sure. Nice pick, Matt. Have you seen this? I have still not seen it. I, I'm pretty it's, sure it's on Netflix. You've I, I got will. to watch this movie. I will. See, throw that in the jaw box if it's uh, streaming anywhere for me, Phil. Swings it over to my number one. And if, if you've ever watched on our, our dumb little uh, YouTube, it was What is Cinema Jaw? We, we had that little video. And oh, this, yeah. This one famously came up in there. And, um, you know, speaking of uh, bringing it back to Gordon's film a little bit, uh, 63 Boycott, where uh, I was just talking about, like, sometimes I get really depressed that we aren't making changes. And, and what can I do to change? And I remember watching this movie and, and it answering that one person can make a change. I'm speaking of just an absolutely gorgeous documentary entitled Born into Brothels. Have you seen this one, yeah, Gordon? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I know the filmmakers. Yeah. Okay. And I remember watching this, and I, I probably didn't know exactly what it was uh, about going into it. And, and I watched this film, and here this, uh, this young woman goes over to Calcutta, India, and she is going to photograph um, basically prostitutes in the red light district. And what happens is while she's out there, she actually comes into contact with a lot of the prostitutes' kids and what a sad situation this is, right? I mean, they're, they're children of prostitutes who are still working. Um, they're running sort of free in the streets. And they come up with this idea that um, 
they'll, they'll actually teach the kids about photography and art, and they give these kids cameras and say, hey, go take interesting pictures of the brothels, of your life. What's it look like? And, um, and then in return, I mean, this beautiful moment where the kids actually start to get the photographs, and it doesn't stop there. She takes these photographs and ends up putting them out as artwork out in New York, raising money, and then taking that money and getting those kids out of Calcutta into schools, um, and, and some went on to you know, universities. And I mean, what a touching story for one person to make that kind of impact in these children's lives. It, I, I remember I was, I was sobbing at the end of this movie. I loved it. I was so touched and moved by the impact that one person can have. It made me think, I can do this. What am I doing here, watching movies? Good. <laughs> It, it's funny now that I, I talk about the movie again because I haven't talked about it in, in so long. My number one movie of 2017 was The Florida Project in which we're seeing poverty through you know, a six-year-old having a blast at these motels not knowing that she's growing up in poverty. Very similar situation. That one obviously you know, a, a work of fiction. It's a movie sure. and, and here you have a documentary on it. But, but it's a very documentary feeling uh, fiction film. Right. It is. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's but true I, to life. But it's funny now that I think about that. I, I have a, a soft spot for that, you know? Interesting, Ryan. You so. just learned something about yourself. I well did. done. That was my number one. Any honorable mentions, Matt Kay? I mean, it, there's so many. Um, Dark Days. I, I bring it up a ton on the show, so I didn't want to, like, mm-hmm. s- slot it in again, but it's it, impactful, certainly for the people that, that lived in the tunnels there. Um, Super Size Me. Huge. Yep. Changed. I, I mean, changed McDonald's, so if nothing else... You know, that's a multi-billion dollar corporation, yeah. so very impactful. And, and one I, I mentioned at the top while we were uh, interviewing um, Gordon was The Interrupters. Wow, what a movie. This one wowed me, and this is The Interrupters. They're trying to interrupt the violence that we have going on here in Chicago. Yeah. And the, the, the great work that these people are, are doing literally on the streets because – you can't make a difference uh, unless you're sort of out there and, and you hate to say it, but in the trenches of this sort of warf- warfare that is going on out there. And these people are brave enough and, and taking the time to make a difference. And, and Steve James made a wonderful film with that one. It's a great film. And, you know, you get to know people that appear for a moment on the news. They're just – they're a soundbite. But in the right. ru- interrupters, you get to see the family, you get to see the tensions within the family, you get to, to, to encounter them as complicated, real human beings. And I think that's, you know, some of the great power of that film. Yeah. But if we missed yours, if you're listening to this and we missed an impactful documentary that you want to get mentioned on There's the show. There's thousands of them. I, and there are. Uh, please write us feedback at cinemajaw.com or got Twitter pulled up at Cinema Job. Make it nice and easy for you. We will read those comments on the next episode. What we're going to do is take a quick break, and when we come back, we got a cinema war looking at post credit scenes, plus Gordon versus Matt K in animal title movie trivia in honor of Black oh, Panther. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll be right back <coughs> on Cinema Jaw. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. To get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. Hey, Jawheads, this is Matt Kay, and I want to tell you about the Docs on the Fox Film Festival. It's going to be taking place on the weekend of March 23rd in scenic Batavia, Illinois, just west of Chicago, on the Fox River, hence the name. The inaugural fest will focus on short documentaries from the Midwest and throughout the world. For tickets or to submit your film, Go to Docs on the Fox, and that's D O X on the Fox.com. And also check out their film Freeway for a discount on submissions. That's Docs on the Fox. Stories so amazing, you can't make them up. See you there, guys. Looking for a way to support Cinema Jaw? The easiest way to do it is Patreon. That's right, Rye. If you go to patreon.com backslash Cinema Jaw, you can check out all our cool rewards for the different levels at which you could be a patron of Cinema Jaw. And all those Patreons, thank you, who are already on, and, and those future ones, thank you in advance, because really, you're the lifeblood of Cinema Jaw. Indeed. I couldn't have said it better, Rye. To get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. 
we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Gordon Quinn from Cartem Quinn. Um, and you had mentioned the big week that you had at Sundance, but when did you guys, Cartem Quinn, start going out to Sundance? For, for many years? Uh, we've gone out there for many years, but actually the first was Hoop Dreams. Uh, Hoop Dreams got into Sundance, and it premiered at Sundance. And, you know, I think these young guys, Steve and, and Peter Gilbert and, and Fred Marks, I think had more of a sense of what it was than I was. I was like, Sundance? What's that? You know, I, it wasn't really on my radar, but that was when we really discovered Sundance and how important it was in terms of releasing films and stuff like that. And as far as, and, and we just did a, a, a read there for our, our friend's um, documentary, documentary film festival. festival, which is great that he's, he's getting this thing going, but as far as festivals around the country, is Sundance the best for documentaries, or is there something else out there that you would recommend the listeners to try to check out? Well, it's, it's Sundance is very big, and it's very big in terms of, you know, all of the industry and the deal-making that goes on there. But there are other festivals that I really love. You know, I'm a big fan of Full Frame uh, in Durham, where you go and you're there with all the other filmmakers, and it's, it's an all-documentary festival. And so you hang out with filmmakers and really talk about documentary and that kind of thing. So that's a, that's a particular favorite of mine. I've also liked uh, <coughs> the internet. <coughs> ITFA in Amsterdam, the International Documentary Film Festival, is, you know, there's some business that goes on there internationally, but it's also a great festival for talking about documentaries. But that's one of the things that really has changed now. There are all these great documentary film festivals around the country. There's True False uh, in Missouri. There's, you know, there's like a lot of festivals that just show documentaries, yeah. which I yeah. think is a great place for, you know, for the public to go and kind of really immerse yourself in that doc world. Absolutely. And now there's docs on the Fox, Matt. I yeah. like it. It's um, growing. Yeah. Again, for the jawheads listening to this that want to find out more about Cartemquin Films, the best place to do so online, Gordon? It's uh, cartemquinfilms.com. That's K-A-R. T-E-M is in Mary. Q-U-I-N as in Nancy.com. And there's a lot of information there about all of our films over the years. And you can join Cartemquin and you can get our newsletter and all of that. Do awesome. It. Yeah. Matt, before we get to trivia and before we get to Cinema War, we threw a few items into the job box. And I know Phil wants to get out of there and uh, make a documentary himself about maybe living in a job box. Let's open up that job box. What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. We got a box! Uh, what's in the box? Yeah, hey guys, thank you so much. It's, uh, I, I like to think of it, especially now that Elias has gone almost like a studio apartment, uh, yeah, I have a little corner for my bed. I will say I am uh, uh, feeling a little under the weather because I, I've been missing him. Elias is usually our sanitation guy. He'll mop up and clean out the mold. Plus, he's warm, you know? So when you guys, like, spoon, it, it keeps your body temperature up, which is good for the health. It was mutually beneficial, yeah. Indeed. Just to point out, I'm warm, too. Uh, <laughs> with that being said, we did have a couple of questions to throw in, thrown in. Uh, the first one, who plays Schmidt in the Cloverfield Paradox? That actor's name is Daniel Brull. Oh, Brull, yes. And, uh, I, think, I believe it's Brule. There Brule? is an umlaut over the U, yes. There is, yeah. Uh, and the villain that he played that you had mentioned was uh, Helmut Zemo uh, yes. from Captain America Civil War. Uh, the next one, this one was kind of tricky to find out. What is the financial status of SeaWorld? Uh, overall, I, I, so what I found out, I didn't see anything about, um, chapter 11 bankruptcy or I, I saw like, it was like 85% sales have went down since Blackfish, uh, but they're, believe it or not, still open and they're also still doing orca shows in some parks. Wow. They're, they're, they're quoted to end them in 2019. All right, so at least we got a timeline there. And 85% is nothing to sneeze at. So, yes, safe to say Blackfish impactful. Absolutely. Uh, the next one I have is who sings the – what is the song at the end of Inconvenient Truths? That's Melissa Etheridge's I Need to Wake Up. Mm. And that song sounds like this. Because I need to move. You 
like nice. that song? Oh, I loved it. In context, I, I need to move, man. In, in context to watching the movie, Inconvenient Truth, and then it came on, and it was giving all these facts. I still remember the way the movie ended. It okay. was giving you all these you know, use a recyclable uh, shopping bag, do this. And the song was playing. It was like, yeah, I can do all these things. I was moved. I guess, I guess, in context, that just hurt my ears. I'm not, <laughs> not a fan. I'm going to admit it. Was that everything? Uh, we actually, we have one more is F is for fake on Netflix. Uh, no, it is not. I, I actually couldn't find it on Netflix, Hulu, nor Amazon Prime. My best guess uh, is that Matt was confusing it for the Bill Burr cartoon, F is for Family, because that is what I kept seeing in every single search. Oh, man. Well, oh. I'll have to go to my local library, I guess. For or was I? Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I definitely streamed it. I, maybe it was on and then came off. Who knows? Who knows? All right. We did get some feedback, though, Matt. Oh, I love getting feedback. This one came in from Dion from East Lansing, Michigan. Dion says, hello, boys. Love your podcast. I've listened every week since discovering it late last summer. I've also caught up on all available archived episodes, which is how I learned too late to meet the great Elias Rodriguez when he brought his short film Think Twice to my hometown of East Lansing. Sadly, I was actually at that film festival, but in another viewing room, watching another set of shorts oh sorry man so close speaking of elias dion goes on to say i am writing to correct an inaccurate piece of information he dispensed from the jaw box in the last episode he said that the, that the twins in the original parent trap movie were played by two different girls not exactly Haley mills played both characters because special effects were not much available in 1961, another actress named Susan Henning was brought in as a twin double, and when the scene called for both girls to be on screen at the same time, she was used. Her face was never seen on screen, and she was, given, she was not given a credit for the part. So now you know. Keep up the good work. Hopefully you will have another live show one of these days, as I would absolutely love to make the trek around the lake to see it. Sincerely, Dion from East Lansing. Oh, thanks, Dion. Um, I love, uh, we mentioned how the jawheads write in and catch when we make mistakes and or announcements. Yeah. Right? And so here we had Elias making a mistake uh, and people wanted to correct. So did Patty McCabe Davis. She wrote in, sorry, guys, to correct Elias on his last show, boo-hoo, but he's not correct about Parent Trap. Haley Mills played both twins. Check it out on the movie poster. Also, I already tweeted this, but not sure you'll get it. Great creepy twin movie, number one, Sisters, starring Margot Kidder, written and directed by Brian De Palma, came out in 1972. Huh. She saw it in a drive-in in the 70s, and it still haunts her. Cool. And two, Dead Ringers, starring Jeremy Irons as twin gynecologists with some of the most nauseating GYN equipment anyone has ever seen. <laughs> Both these movies are kind of the same trope of the one diseased twin, a basket case, but much higher quality. Thanks, as always, for your fabulous podcast. Yours is the only podcast I always listen to, and I listen to a lot of them. Love it. Patty McCabe Davis. Wow. Thanks, Patty. Yeah. Thanks, Patty. Like, again, I, I love when they, they, they really harp on Elias now that he's not here. Yeah. yeah of course. Yeah. I was making mistakes left and right. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, was that everything, Phil? That certainly was. All right. Get back in that job box. Will do. Thank you. Thank Matt, you. it brings us to a segment called Cinema War. Cinema War works like this. Me and Matt, we're fighting on a topic. Our guest this week, Gordon Quinn, plays judge, jury, and executioner and tells the listeners at home who he thinks won the cinema war. That's important, Matt, because we're fighting for jaw time to rant and rave on whatever we want. post credit scenes, man, what do you think? Phil, tell the jawheads at home what today's cinema war topic is. Yes, today's cinema war topic, James Mangold, director of critically acclaimed Logan, is against post credit scenes. Is he right or is he wrong? Rye, you'll be fighting for, he is right. Post-credit scenes are out of control. And Matt, you'll be fighting for, wrong. Post-credit scenes rock. Let this post-credit cinema war begin. Matt, post-credit scenes are like so many trends we see in Hollywood. First time they pop up, amazing. But then we just get more and more of them until they are unoriginal, 
boring and serve no other reason than to get us excited to spend more money on the next movie. You know, we really should put the cinema war after the, the credits of the show, but Ry, put your adamantium claws back in your pockets. James Mangold thinks post credit scenes cheapen the theater going experience. I say it's an ingenious way to get people to stay and watch the credits. Uh, so now I know who the best boy was on the Avengers. Brilliant. <laughs> Matt, my biggest gripe here with the post credit scenes, and hear me out here, is that they are not very creative way to add a character or a theme or a future storyline into a movie. It's like we're giving the filmmakers a massive break by letting them add something completely out of context of the story we just saw. Want to fit something in that gets me excited for the next Marvel movie or blockbuster? Then figure out a way to put it in the actual movie. I don't know, man. It's a bit of crass commercialism, but this is a business. And as the line between movies and TV becomes more blurred, audiences need something to get them excited for, wait for it, the next trip to the theater. So what's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong with it, Matt. I already complained there's too many damn previews before a movie. Now with a Marvel film, we have the same issue after. Enough already. All right. But it's part of the runtime. We know what to expect. Uh, Easter eggs, hidden messages, and post-credit scenes add a layer of fun and interest to movie going. <coughs> We're excited to see what has been crammed into each new entry and into a developing narrative. I'm excited to find out a little bit more about what's coming next. It's just another opportunity to be creative and have fun with the art form. But a film is like a piece of art. The artist should say everything he needs to say on the canvas or in the reel. Throwing a post credit scene these days usually has nothing to do with the film we just saw, but for some future installment. I paid to be entertained by the story <laughs> at hand, not on ads for future mass-produced Stuff down our throat summer blockbusters. All right, first of all, who are you or James Mangold to say what the artist should do? Again, keeping people in their seats through the credits helps the movie business by letting people know just how many heads it takes to make one of these things. So Logan didn't need a post credit scene. Good for Logan. It's an artistic choice. Artistic is the operative word. Scenes need to deliver, and even James Mangold admits that the post credit scenes deliver. They're fun. We are buttonheads here on Cinema War. We do it every week, man. Every week. Shouldn't be a shocker. We throw it to our guest, our jury. Gordon, what did you think of this Cinema War? Um, I'm not sure that I've ever seen a post credit <laughs> scene like what you're talking about. So, the, but at the end of I, Marvel I got, films, I, yeah. I, I, I get the idea. Um, <laughs> you know, I have seen things where there are things in the credits or even that come up afterwards that are really creative and really kind of do something that resonates with the movie that you just have seen. So I'm not like out of hand, you know, it should never be done. I think if it's creative, if it's really tied to the movie that you've seen, it can be an interesting way of kind of putting a punctuation on something, putting some context in something, that kind of thing. Uh, on the other hand, if it's just an ad for the next movie, that I, I find a total pain in the ass. Uh, but I think there are some pretty creative things that people have done, both integrating things into the credits at the end and also, uh, you know, even after, you know, you sort of get the idea, oh, i got to sit through this because there is going to be something that's, that's going to pay off in some kind of way. And I've, I've seen it where it was like, whoa, that was pretty interesting. So who do you think made the better argument, though? I think I would probably go with you because thank you, you wow. thank you. He is he is pointing yeah, you towards were, me. You were you were complaining about the fact that they're really just ads. Yes, which is, uh, that that I don't appreciate, but yes. I do appreciate it when they really have done something creative uh, with it and integrated it in a way that sometimes, you know, it's like oh, okay. I agree. Yeah. Matt, I know this is shocking, but that is six wins in a row for it, me. It can't go I am forever. undefeated in 2018. Uh, well, enjoy it while it lasts, right? Yeah, it earns me 20 seconds of jaw time to rant and rave on whatever we want. We mentioned Abacus, small enough to jail. One of the great things that I think the Academy still does to this day, uh, even for people who see lots and lots of movies and review and talk about movies each week like me and you do, Matt, is categories like best foreign film, and best documentary, they cast a light on movies that, for a lot of people, myself included, 
have not gotten around to see all of them. Yeah. So do yourself a favor, look at the Academy Awards, see what was nominated, and, and in those categories, check them out. See yeah. why they were nominated. That's what these award shows do best, and that's what it's for. I'm doing it. I, I went and saw Abacus after, I, like I said, it's out on Amazon. I see that it's uh, nominated. I know it's Steve James and, and Kartemquin. I'm seeing it. So uh, I encourage everybody else to do the well, same. Good use of your time there, right? There you go. All right, Matt. Brings us to trivia. I don't know. I mean, let's be honest, Hill. Gordon Quinn is under the weather. He, he may hopefully can, can come through. We are playing animal movie trivia in, in animal title, you know, animal in the title. Got it. Got for it. Black Panther. Now, Gordon, you're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first or let Matt go first. It's only eight questions, and you get a steal if the person doesn't know their, their question. Okay, then I'll let him go first. All right. Question one, Matt. Animal title movie Got trivia. It. Who starred as the lead, Neville Flynn, in the movie Snakes on a Plane? Oh, um, Sam Jackson. One to nothing. Question two, over to Gordon. Name the 1994 Disney film that had characters named Scar, Simba, and Mufasa. Animated. Oh, an animated Disney movie. Um, not that I would know, but I feel like I ought to know, but I don't. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to win this. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you know this one? The Lion King? Oh, the Lion King. The Lion King. Yeah. I should have got that. Yes. <laughs> I, I sort of felt like it sounded familiar. Here we go. Question three over to Matt K. Matt, in 1980. Okay. We're going back some time. Uh -huh. John Hurt, Anthony Hopkins starred in a film directed by David Lynch. Name it. And it's got an animal. An animal in the title. John Hurt and, and Anthony Hopkins. David Lynch directed. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. Swings I should it, really know swings that. Swings it over to Gordon. I Gordon, do you have a guess on this one? No, but I'll probably know it when you say it. Yeah. We were looking for the Elephant Man. Oh, oh man. Holy I should have got Gordon. that. I should have got that. Yeah. Uh, question four over to Gordon. Gordon, in 2011, the film War Horse told the story of a stallion during World War I. Who directed that movie? Uh, I, it starts with a B. Is it Ballinger or? Got to think big, big time director. Uh, you do it. Oh, 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 no, that's, it's not Spielberg. It was Spielberg. He is on the board two to one. It was Steven Spielberg yeah, directed War Horse. That's right. I, I was, I was thinking of a, di actually I was thinking of a different movie. You were thinking a of Black bit. Stallion. Yes, that's the <laughs> movie I was thinking. It is two to one. Uh, we quite uh, throw question number five over to Matt K. Matt in the movie Reservoir Dogs, who played Mr. Orange? Oh, um, that was Buscemi, right? He oh. played Mr. Pink. He oh, played that's Mr. right. Pink. Famously complains about it too. Yes. Gordon, you can tie it up. Do you know who played Mr. Orange in I Reservoir Dogs? This was the undercover cop. Um, no, Harvey Keitel. Another character actor, Tim Roth. Oh, Tim okay. Roth. Yeah. Good ball game here. Three questions left. Two to one. Question six over to Gordon. In 1994, James Spader, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Jack Nicholson starred in a one-word title film. Uh, just give me those stars again. Yeah. Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer, Jack Nicholson, Nicholson and James and Spader. James Spader. Uh, one word one title word, film. And it's an and animal. It, and it's an animal. Um, oh, give, Want me a clue? A, give me a clue. Whoa, <laughs> question six. Phil. I don't know this one either. Fill us in. What was the name of that 1994 film? Gordon, your clue is Liam Neeson has been attacked by a pack of these in the gray. <laughs> well, what travels in a pack? Yeah. That helps, I guess. But it's only one word. Yeah. Um, wolf? Wolves? Nailed it. Wolf. I've never seen this movie. Have you? Yeah. No, no, I've never even heard of it, dude. <laughs> it is two to two. I two don't know how something like that flies completely <laughs> under the radar. Yeah. 
<coughs> two to two, last two questions of the game. Matt, here you go. Okay. We all know Michael J. Fox played the lead in Teen Wolf. Uh-huh. But what actor took over for him in Teen Wolf 2? Oh, uh, Justin Bateman. It's Jason Bateman. J- okay. Jesus. I almost Justine could is his close, sister. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. You can give him that. <laughs> All right. Last question. Hopefully Gordon ties it up here. Gordon, name the 1978 movie that starred Robert De Niro, Christopher Walken, Meryl Streep, and won the Oscar for Best Picture. In 1978? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> 78. De Niro. Meryl Streep. Yep. Christopher Walken. Yep. Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro. Won the Oscar for Best Picture. And it does have a, a, an animal in the title. In the name. In the name. Is it two words? Three total. The oh. something. Two words. No, I was thinking. Two words after the the. Yeah. I probably am going to know it when you say oh, it. Oh, I'm but sure. I don't know it. Matt, you got a guess? I, I, it's the deer hunter. Oh, yes. the deer hunter. The deer hunter. Yeah. Yes. There you go. That's a I've classic. Just, yeah, I mean, yeah. Robert De Niro and Christopher Walken. I think their only collaboration. <coughs> Is it really? I believe. Interesting. Could be wrong. Yeah. Um, if it came down to a jawbreaker, this one would have been over to Matt K. Age. Oh, first to Matt K. Better pig movie: Oakjaw or Babe? You got to go with Oakjaw. It's Babe. I'm oh. joking. The real jawbreaker is this. Age of James Spader, closest to. If it uh, was a tie, what would have you said, man? Okay, so I'd say he's about 58. You mean now? Yeah. James Spader, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say older. Believe it or not, he's 58 years old. How would you get wow. that? You never guess on the dot. Yeah. That's 58. crazy. 58, well done. Good actor. Great actor. Yeah. Just did the, the voice of Ultron. Yep. Speaking of Marvel movies. Wow. Brings us to the end of a great jaw, and what a jaw it was. Indeed. Um, first and foremost, we have to thank our guest, Gordon Quinn. It was uh, a pleasure meeting you, and, and thanks so much for coming on Cinema Jaw. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for making it out, uh, feeling ill under, under the, the weather. Under the weather here, that the, the, the flu has raced through Cartamquin. I mean, it's just every, it's hit so many people. It's I, going around. That could be a subject for a documentary, I think. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm like, all I want to say, and it, I, it's, it's more like a Facebook meme. Get your flu shot, <laughs> young people. <laughs> Absolutely. We also got to thank our sponsors. Yes. Thanks to all the great sponsors and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get the sponsors. Thanks to Phil Me and Phil, our editor. Not a problem. Thank you, guys. Um, please uh, leave us a review on iTunes. Those reviews help attract new listeners, right? They do. Yeah. Until next week, I'm Ryan the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And, and keep, keep on John about, about the movies. movies.